like I'd let you get away. You'll be sliced to ribbons. Before you ever... Hey, welcome to another episode of Boundary Break, a show where we basically take the camera anywhere we want to try to find secrets and new discoveries to some of our favorite games. So before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Franz Boloma, who made the camera tool for this episode. You can see links to his stuff down below. And like I said earlier, we're going to be looking at stuff out of bounds with Resident Evil 8, and it gets pretty interesting, I'll tell you that. But you know what? I'd rather show it than tell, so why don't we get started? So to start with, there is something really interesting about Resident Evil 8. For some reason, the developers leave in the entire body of Ethan throughout the entire adventure, minus his head. Now this includes cutscenes as well, so whenever the body's flying around or he's doing some mocap acting, everything's there. The torso, the legs, the arms, but, but not the head, yeah. But <laughs> why not the head? Okay, well the reason why there's no head is because if there was a head, you could see some of the geometry uh, from the perspective of where the camera is. And an example of that is by restoring the head onto the body, you can see exactly what you would see if the head was always attached. And yeah, see, it obstructs the view a bit. That's why you can't have it. But again, not having a head in a first person shooter game is very typical. Having the rest of the body, it's not as common. Usually at best you have the arms, but usually even then, whatever's not on screen is not there. So as an excuse to show you a little bit more footage, I, I'm still flabbergasted by the idea that there's actually mocap acting for a body that you pretty much never get to see, because the sequences for all these cutscenes take place in first person, so unreal stuff. And that isn't to say that you don't get to see Ethan's head officially. Towards the end of the game, you finally get to see cutscenes outside of Ethan's perspective, but the developers still went for the trouble of hiding his face. Well, however, moving the camera around, we'll show you that they did take the time to actually detail his face. It's just that no matter what cutscene, even if we restore the head to normal gameplay, there's no facial acting, which you know, makes perfect sense. Why would you go for the effort of animating that if no one's ever gonna see it? But then again, why go for the effort of animating an entire body if nobody's gonna see it? I, it's still so confusing for me. I love it though. Last chance. You don't wanna find out what's in that hole. I'll take my chances. Your funeral. So sometimes on this show we talk about sky domes or sky boxes, and in case you don't know what that is, that's usually the last encasing of whatever environment there is in a video game, and typically it's skies or sea and sometimes stars, but in the case of Resident Evil 8, it's a little bit different. There is one sky dome throughout the entire game, including the village itself, but I first discovered it inside of Ethan's house. It's this real life environment, and I was really curious to see if I could figure out where this environment actually was in the world. So I went onto Twitter to ask people if they recognized where this place was, and somebody was able to figure it out. Out. It's the Kensington Gardens in London, which belonged to a royal palace, which was once private, but now is public. Which is very appropriate since most of Resident Evil 8 takes place in Europe. But funny enough, because someone was able to tell me exactly where this place was, I was able to relocate it on Google Maps. And so what you're looking at here is a replication of the same exact area only on Google Maps. And whether you try to look for this in the village or in Ethan's house, you can never see the Sky Dome in full. Certainly not enough to be able to distinguish the fact that it's from the Kensington Gardens. Okay, let's talk about some really cool and interesting things that I found out of bounds. Or even in bounds, like in the case here with this cigar that's being held by the Duke. Now this is a detail that is so minuscule, so it'd be very hard to catch it on your own. But if you look at the label on the cigar, it is the house sigil of Heisenberg, which is the horse with the horseshoe. Now you can speculate what this would mean lore-wise, but also keep in mind that the same cigar is used in a scenario within Heisenberg's factory. However, a detail that is a lot harder to see is at the very start of the game. The first house that you go to when you visit the village has a small small crack right here and if you look very very closely you might be able to figure out that there is a single pig in there but once again it's not easy at all to make out that detail taking the camera inside however reveals that there's not just one pig but there are several pigs and that the player was never meant to be inside of here because the walls are completely untextured to give off that dark vibe now reflections are really interesting in resident evil 8 they try not to have any real reflections so that ethan can't have his face revealed and also it's easier on resources but there is one scene in the game where there's a true reflection or at least you would think here in this one scene you can see lady d talking to mother miranda and if you shift the camera around you can start to see that the reflection isn't truly a reflection 
It's just a pre-rendered cutscene that's laid over the mirror, and that by moving the camera around, it distorts the imagery that is carefully placed and stretched to match the player's perspective. Still not convinced? After Lady D throws the mirror, the player never can really see the reflection of the mirror anymore. However, taking the camera over there will show you that it's still reflecting the original position that it had before the mirror was thrown. Also, if we take a close look at the money, you can see that words are written out on it. And in case you thought that this had any special meaning as well, you'd be wrong. Uh, it's actually, in fact, lorem ipsum, which is a famous placeholder text that is supposed to be nonsensical and improper Latin. Doing this for a living, I've been seeing this a lot more in video games. One other example I can immediately think of when I worked on it was ukulele. And moving on from that, I always love to try to find T-posing in any of these games. It's a bit of a rarity. Maybe for some people it feels like repetitive content, but for me, it's all about finding it in the first place. Like in Resident Evil 8, you can barely ever find it. However, I did manage to find it in two separate scenes. There's this one where Chris is finally reintroduced into the game since the start, and underneath this cutscene is Salvatore, which is probably one of the best creatures in this game to have a T-pose. Unpausing the game will show that the tentacles do in fact move while Salvatore is in the T-pose. And the reason why Salvatore is down here at all is because later on in the cutscene, the gang is interrupted, and when Ethan manages to find a dock to wash up on, Salvatore reveals himself. Funny enough, the only other T-Post I could find in this game was in the same exact area. Once you defeat Salvatore as a boss, there's a cutscene that plays out where Salvatore goes to explode, and Ethan himself can be found in a T-Pose, and if you let the animation run itself out, you can see that he slides a little bit to the left and then turns around and twists his legs. It's... <laughs> I don't know why. And then for this scene, I... Okay, so just keep in mind here, I check inside the clothing of every single character model to see what I can show the audience, and I still have to decide what's appropriate to actually show on YouTube. I think werewolf butt is okay, I think. And as you can see, if you go inside of the werewolf's trousers, you can see a butt and a little bit of a tail at the end too. Something that never gets shown, thank God, right? And then next up, there's a scene inside Heisenberg's factory, and this is really freaking cool. So you eventually get this Mad Max device that's given to you by Chris, and I thought the controls in this thing were way too good considering how bulky and clunky it looked, so I had to see what that looked like from another angle, and yeah, yeah it, it looks a little silly from a third-person perspective. So we got a sponsor this week. It's from the original developers of Angry Birds, which is really cool, and they got their new title, Darkfire Heroes, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about it and what the game has to offer. So I had a chance to sit down and play this one, and I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with it as far as mobile games go. The game's got you covered with a robust single-player campaign, but it also has PvP in it, and you go through real-time battles fighting off evil hordes. You got over 50 heroes that you can collect, as well as leveling up and equipping said heroes. It's pretty impressive. Lots of customizable strategy here. I suppose it falls into the genre of turn-based RPG battlers, but it plays a little bit differently than that. It's a lot more fast-paced, and actually, if I was to describe it as anything, it feels like a tower defense type game, except you're on the offense. The various mobs that you're going to encounter have different types of strategies that you should apply to them, and then you should customize your team to deal with said mob threat. But let's say going through a single-player campaign is not your thing. There is definitely a lot for competitive people here. You could join a guild, participate in tournaments, and interact with an active community. Personally, from my playtime with the game, I can tell that the developers had a lot of passion put into this project. If you're looking for a mobile game that has a true gamer at heart, this game will take skill, timing, and precision in order to complete. But yeah, anyways, if you're interested in the game, go ahead and give it a download. Uh, I'll have information for that in the video description down below. Thanks again to Rovio for sponsoring this video. Appreciate it. And then there's Donna. Now, when you defeat Donna, there is a very brief scene where you can see her face and you can see that her eye is grayed out. Now, here's the really interesting thing, okay? In scenes where Donna's alive, if you take the camera through her veil, you can see her true eye color. All right, let's talk about this Lady D boss fight. So first of all, taking the camera outside of its intended boundaries can show you that most of this building is not rendered. This is to save on resources, but be mindful of this as we go forward. There's still something interesting to talk about here, but because it's not fully modeled, you can also see the boss model being stored underneath. And by moving Ethan just a little bit past the trigger point, you can see the exact moment in which the boss gets warped from underneath the stage to where she needs to be to trigger a cutscene. And during this boss fight, there's an impressive amount of destruction going on with the environment. How is that pulled off exactly? Well, if I slow down the footage really, really slow, you can see where the main environment is swapped out with a destructible environment. It's almost seamless even when you zoom it out, to be honest with you. But by slowing down the footage, you can see things like the spire disappearing and other levels of detail that is apparent when you slow it down to this degree. 
okay, so the boss fight's over and now Ethan's falling through the tower. Now's a good time to see what's going on with that tower that we were just looking at a second ago. And now you can see that the midsection of the tower is not called out anymore. I'll be honest, I'm still a little bit impressed by this because the interior of this tower looks incredibly different from the exterior of the tower. So a lot of this tower that I'm showing you right now, the player never really gets to see, at least not at this point in time in the game. And now I'm going to show you where various actors go in various scenes. Uh, most of this is a little underwhelming, but I know that a lot of people would want to know. So I'm just going to dispel any of the mystery or the intrigue. The first of which I'm going to show you is the mouse. There's a jump scare mouse that happens in this game. And taking the camera very close up to the mouse for the record, not a disappointment. It's a very well detailed mouse. But taking the camera in before Ethan can even see the mouse, you can see that there's a little bit of a wind up animation that the player doesn't get to see. And then it goes off to the side there. Where does it go exactly? Well, it goes through a little mouse hole that's through this plank of wood, and then when it's outside of the player's view, the model just stops and freezes and never disappears. So this mouse stays indefinitely frozen in this one spot. And then we got this first scene where you meet the witch. I won't spoil exactly who the witch is, but I'm just gonna call her the witch for now. Boy, she's looking really happy after leaving Ethan here. And I think a lot of players would wanna know where she goes. Well, there's this whole walk cycle animation that's a little desynced with the environment, if I'm honest. So she goes through the building's walls, doing a little boundary breaking of her own, then she pops out of existence, but I think it's just that she's called out because her staff remains. And then there's this jump scare here, and a lot of people probably wonder where this character comes from because, well, if you look at the environment before you do this, there's nothing really there to really indicate that anything would pop up at you. And it's sad to say, it just kind of loads in. Same thing with these zombies that crawl out of the ground here. They're not really stored anywhere, they just suddenly appear, and then their animation starts before you even get a chance to see it. <laughs> Here is a side-by-side -side comparison of how tall Lady D is compared to Ethan, minus his head, of course. And I'm just gonna let that play out for a little bit here and there, use two different clips. But one size comparison that you guys might not even think to do is the one between Ethan and Duke. Duke is actually a lot larger than you would imagine. He's not just an overweight gentleman, he seems to amass over Ethan in every conceivable way, right down to his limbs. The best size comparison of which is in Heisenberg's factory, where he's probably the most level with Ethan than with any other point in the game. And then we got dev cubes. I just want to talk about dev cubes for a little bit. Again, one of those things that you see frequently on Boundary Break. But if you understand where I'm coming from, dev cubes are not a guarantee. They're just something that is very interesting when they are discovered. And so the first dev cube that I found was actually underneath the scene here with the first human characters that you discover in Resident Evil Village when he actually shows up at the village. In my attempt to try to find the body, which I did very briefly, I'm not even going to bother to show you, I was shocked to discover a dev cube. And then once again in the area where you first meet Chris, in the village there was like a dev rectangle here this was really far outside the boundaries so i couldn't even tell you what this could possibly be for it might be just to trigger the cutscene between ethan and salvatore and then big spoilers here just before mother miranda was just about to kill ethan there's a giant dev rectangle right behind him and we're going to save the best zoom out for last but we're going to talk about what happens when you pan the camera out in various areas the first of which is an interior scene this is inside lady d's castle and you'll see that various objects do not deload or get called out when you're in certain rooms so things like for example the duke himself will always be hanging outside the boundaries no matter what which is really cool to think about the other objects you can see here are vases as well as the collectible goat statues and then here's a creepy thing to just think about lady d works the same as mr x from resident evil 2. now i highly recommend you watch the resident evil 2 episode after this one i'm talking about the remake of course and mr x when you're not in the same vicinity as him, is still wandering the halls no matter what. So Mr. X never deloads, and the same can be said for Lady D. Now Lady D doesn't seem to be as intelligent as Mr. X when it comes to her AI. On multiple occasions, I've seen her just walk into a door frame and not do anything about it. But all the same, her character exists whether you're there or not. As for towards the end of the game, you got the scene with Evelyn explaining a lot of exposition and everything's really blurry, but I'll let you guys in on something. I don't know why they made her super blurry because it is in fact the character model for Evelyn, most likely the same one used in Resident Evil 7. But there's something way more interesting about this area, way, 
way more interesting. I don't think I've seen this anywhere else up to this point, but if you zoom the camera all the way out of this area, you can see that the fog is encased in a box. And guess what? That is not the interesting thing. It's what's outside of the fog box. There's a little bit of geometry way down below during this whole cutscene. And far below down there is a piecemealed version of Ethan's house, indicating probably that the house was meant to be used during this cutscene, but was later scrapped, as this modulated version of Ethan's house doesn't exist anywhere in the game, and certainly shouldn't exist in this scene. And then we got the ending of the game. There's lots of interesting stuff here. The bus that Ethan's daughter was riding actually gets stored underneath the environment after it's done with the scene. And the mother and daughter that was used in that scene are stored there for a little while too. And the mother and daughter make some sort of human centipede-like creature as they're stored in the exact same position and also both in an A pose. They don't stay there forever though. Another little interesting tip is that the book that Ethan's daughter is holding at the end of the cutscene is actually stored in one of the very final scenes ahead of the vehicle. So far ahead in the last shot that you can't even really see the geometry of the book as the car drives through it. And then lastly, of course, if you beat the game, you would see a figure walking way off in the distance and a lot of you want to know who that is. Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious and I'm glad that Capcom made it who we all think it probably was. It's Ethan, and specifically it's the model of Ethan where his hands are already decaying because he's been discovered as mold. Though, interestingly enough, and again, I hadn't seen this talked about anywhere else, during the last few seconds, Ethan is looking at his daughter. His head tilts towards his daughter as he's walking down the road. And lastly, as I go over a couple of things, please enjoy a zoom out of the entire village as well as seeing some low poly models of areas that are not loaded quite yet. For, so first of all, I just wanna say thank you guys so much for watching. Don't know how this video is going to do. YouTube's been really weird towards my channel lately, so we'll see. But why even bring that up at all? Well, I'm diversifying. Uh, I'm doing stuff on Twitch. If you enjoy hanging out with streamers, my community is still pretty small, so I can pretty much see comments from everybody. It'd be cool to see you there. It turns out I absolutely love streaming, and it's a ton of fun. So I really hope you join me. That'd be great. I also have a side channel that I might start streaming there instead. We'll see. If we can get a good audience over on Twitch, I'll stay there. If not, just subscribe to my side channel. I'll probably eventually move over there if things don't work out on Twitch. Plus, I might drop a completely non-related video to Boundary Break, but still put my heart and soul into it, so you'll get some quality content that's just not Boundary Break. Anyways, I think I gave you a good long enough talk to give you a tour of the village, and I'll catch you again soon. Later.